I would like to accelerate our journey with some technologi technological and social innovations towards sustainable mobility. Let's welcome our following guests on stage. It's Ion Luahu Alua. Ion Luahu Alua. Welcome, please have a seat. It's Ananta Vangmai. And then the last one, Evan Tangen Egernes. Give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Welcome, dear panelists. Great to have you here. So we have Ion Luau Alua from DriveCo. Could you maybe just in a one minute pitch tell a bit more about your company? Yes, uh, good evening everyone. Excited to be here with you. So uh, I'm Yon Liahu Alwash. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, DriveCo. We build and operate uh, EV charging stations since 2010. So we're a, a French pioneer in this uh, industry. Um, we operate today over 6,000 charge points all over France, another 4,000 in construction. We started our life, uh, our company in France, but we're extending uh, very rapidly all across uh, Western Europe. And uh, thanks to the thousands of people that use our chargers every single day, we were able to avoid over 26,000 tons of CO2, which is equivalent to about 2,000 um, households. And uh, that's really our mission, is to decarbonize mobility. All right, that was one minute, uh, minute pitch. Ananta. Um, hi everyone, so I'm Ananta Vangmai, the CEO of Revive Battery, and to put it simply, we do something like a CPR to an almost dead person. We do CPR to lead batteries, we regenerate them and we help them last up to three times um, longer, um, trying to compete with the lithium industry. Uh, but, you know, as they say that lead is dead, I'm here trying to like bring more transparency and a bit more um, awareness around uh, the battery industry in general and how lead batteries can also be, for certain use cases, uh, used much more um, with a brighter potential. Thank you. Evan, your turn. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Evan Hegerness. I'm the general manager of our car sharing business in Europe at Getaround. Uh, so Getaround is uh, the largest car sharing player in Europe uh, where we're connecting uh, people with the car with people that are in need of a car. All right. Um, I'm going to start with you, Ananta. You mentioned that you're reviving lead batteries. I, to be honest, I thought they were dead, um, but you do something amazing with it. Why is that? Because Lithium, that's the future, right? Yeah, a lot of, uh, I mean, right now, there's a lot of uh, spotlight on lithium batteries. Um, and, I mean, rightfully so. They're an amazing bit of technology. Um, they last for a very long time. The energy density is really high. But we need to understand what happens behind the scenes of the industry. And that is, how much lithium do we have in the, um, in, in the world? Uh, what other met metals are you know, involved in the process? And, and is lithium important for every single application? Um, I'm focusing on lead batteries, and this was your, your, your biggest, um, again, 120 years of um, reputation in the market. The technology has been around for a very long time, but 30 years ago, they stopped developing it. And somewhere, a technology that could um, bring lead batteries back to life, reverse the, de the sulfation process, the tiny crystallization that happens inside a lead battery, and there's a possibility of reversing it. So for some reason, this technology did not really become as mainstream. And from, from the, um, the research that I've done ever since I've come into this specific industry is to understand that if a battery can last 10 years, 12 years, there's a design life of a lead battery, and if it can last to 12 years, why are we getting rid of it at just three years? So my attempt is to try and bring more attention to the regeneration of lead batteries and, and build a proper use case around it so that you know, the, the batteries can be used second and, and third lives, and then they're good for recycling. Mm -hmm. So you want to revive the, the lead batteries, so for you, no lithium, not a fan of that? 
lithium, absolutely. Without lithium, no phones, no cell phones, um, no laptops. Um, our world won't be as digital and as connected. Um, there's a battery type for every use case. And it's important for the consumers to know that, OK, if I need to store um, solar, um, you know, solar energy in my house, maybe a lead battery is going to be a safer, cheaper, uh, and more convenient option to have rather than lithium, for example. Because once the lithium battery is, is used, or even if one cell within the lithium battery is, is not working properly, the entire pack is, is of no use. There's no way to regenerate um, lithium batteries. But for lead, yes, there is a possibility of regenerating it. With the nickel, um, yes, there's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So, Ion, we might have a problem now, because at one point we're, we're not able to do something with lithium, but still, you, since you install EV uh, charging stations, you do believe in that technology. Well, I, I agree with what Ananta said. Basically, you have use cases for uh, lithium-ion batteries. You have use cases also for lead batteries. Um, I come from the solar um, energy industry, so I also worked in, Af in projects where you didn't have the electric grid, notably in Africa, where um, lead batteries make more sense just because they're cheaper. But if we look at the transportation sector, where we need a high energy density, a lot of power, and a lot of energy, uh, lithium ion seems to be the technology of choice. Um, but having said that, we're technology agnostic in the sense that we're not working on building electric cars. We're building the infrastructure that puts the energy into those batteries. For, so for us, it's, if it's lithium who wins the game, if it's uh, uh, sodium, if it's uh, other technology, it's, uh, it's, uh, for us, it's all the same. What we're trying to accomplish is to say to people, you can make the transition from the ICE car to an electric car in a very smooth way, meaning you have the car that's available, the car is at a good price point, and once you get into your car, the charging experience is as, let's say, easy and perhaps even more pleasant than putting uh, gas into your uh, uh, old car. And uh, that's what we're working on, in building this infrastructure that is convenient, that is everywhere where people commute uh, on, their, uh, on a daily basis, and at an affordable price, with an added advantage of the electric car, which is that it's three times more efficient than an ICE car. So that already puts us in a good position to have a technology that reduces costs uh, for the end user. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, yeah, we, we install infrastructure, and it's, of course, quite important because it has to be convenient for people to use their electrical vehicle. But I was, I'm based in Belgium, and uh, I've always heard that if we want all Belgian cars, which are only, only 7 million, that we would need the whole electricity network of whole Western Europe. Do we have enough electricity? Do we have enough power? to have the transition towards electrical vehicles? Yeah, so there's a lot of studies that have been done on this topic. So you're looking at the power and the energy. So the power is the electrical grid that you need to build up. And uh, what we notice is that grid operators throughout Europe, and especially in France, have been uh, ramping up their uh, processes, their people, in order to accompany this change. Uh, in terms of energy, uh, right now solar and, and, and wind are, uh, in terms of new capacity, those are the energies that we're pulling on the grid uh, more and more every day. And the fact that you're combining new energy production that is clean, uh, that is modular, that is very fast to deploy, such as solar, with the electric car that actually needs this energy, um, you know, you're matching the demand curve, uh, the dem demand supply curve pretty well. And actually, if you think about it, uh, when you do the calculation, we're only going to need to produce around 20 to 25 percent more energy uh, today for the electric cars than uh, we're using today. And then there's other companies like Get Around that also come into the picture. Mm -hmm. By sharing, uh, sharing the cars uh, uh, means there are less cars on the road and naturally more uh, less energy that needs to be produced. Yeah, let's dig into that because you mentioned we only need 20 to 24 percent extra energy. But of course, if everybody will just over consume their cars, then we still we still have a problem. So, Evan, this is where Get Around uh, comes into the story. Um, what's, what are you trying to convince us of with Get Around? Yeah, so as I said in, in my intro, we're running a two-sided marketplace. That means that we have cars on one side and then we have people renting cars on the other side. Uh, and I think that we're having an impact on both of these verticals. 
uh, on the vehicle side, uh, there are studies from all over Europe that one shared car is replacing between eight and 12 cars on the roads. So if, obviously that is you know, having an impact. On the other side of the equation with the renters, we know that car sharing is preventing people from buying a car. It's uh, you know, pausing a bit for how long does it need for you to own your own car. We have studies from all over Europe as well with people driving less when you have access to cars rather than owning it. Uh, so I think the, the overall mix here is, uh, is a positive um, calculation in the end. Uh, and I mean, it's not just, you know, um, affecting the environment. We're also seeing, you know, how replacing uh, cars with shared cars are also reducing cars from the streets. Um, I went to a conference recently where they talked about every single country in the world being built around cars. And there's basically being two lines both ways, but we're used to driving in one of them each way. And then it's parked cars everywhere. And by reducing cars, I think we can create more efficient cities that are more livable and enjoyable for us as people and citizens as well. So I think that there are many benefits from, you know, not everyone having their own car, but starting to also, you know, get access to cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you mentioned, so, so one shared car, it, it equals eight to ten uh, cars. So you, you save quite a lot of space, in, especially in a city, because that's the context that often it's, it's being used. For example, I gave up my car a couple of years ago, and I'm, I'm also in a car sharing platform. Um, but of course, that's, that's possible because in, I live in, a, in, in an urban, urban context. We cannot do this in a rural area. No, that might be right, but I think that in many uh, unurban areas, a lot of households, they don't have one, only one car, they have two cars. So maybe this is services that can also make sure that you can have one ha car in your household and uh, maybe a small EV that you use for your daily uh, tasks and then you rent a bigger car if you need to go you know, on a longer trip or for certain uh, specific things. So yes, we're biggest in the urban areas where we're operating in the seven countries we are in Europe, but we're also seeing quite a lot large part of our business also happening in what we call tier two and tier three cities that are small one by one, but the, the big combination is becoming quite meaningful. And if you attract new cars, is there a focus on they have to be electrical vehicles? Is there a policy on that topic? So uh, EVs is probably obviously a hot topic with us as well. Uh, I'm based in, in Norway, in Oslo, uh, and Norway, I uh, assume, is one of the most built out markets in the world when it comes to EVs. Uh, so we have the luxury of using Norway as a playing ground to test out what works, what doesn't work, because it's clearly a different game to rent out EVs than a traditional ICE car. So this is a uh, natural evolution of our service as well. And I also think this is, has have to do a bit with the mindset as well. People that were early on the EV trend, they're also early adapters on car sharing uh, services and other services in, uh, in our society. So uh, for sure, EVs are coming. And in the world where I am, we're already seeing like, I think the latest figures from Norway is that 82% of all new cars being sold in 23 were fully electric. And this will come here as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that are uh, quite some... Uh some numbers, is it the same here in France? Yeah, so obviously we're seeing um, the number of new uh, cars that are becoming more and more electric all over the world. Um, today's the biggest market is uh, actually China, which uh, are leading in, in that front in terms of volumes of electric vehicles sold. Uh, they had about uh, 6 million new uh, electric cars that were sold uh, uh, last year for a total of 10 million around the world. Um, Europe is obviously one continent as a whole that is uh, very uh, sensitive to the climate change topic and EVs uh, in general can reduce the CO2 emissions of the transportation sector by 60, 70 percent. Um, so yeah, in, in France, I mean, the, the reason why companies like us exist is because there are electric cars on the road. And the more and more electric cars come on the road, the more and more charges we can put and the more and more we can develop. So we started our, our you know, this entrepreneurial uh, adventure many years ago, but for a very, very long time, we're only about 10 to 15 people. Uh, to give you an idea, in the past uh, three, four years, we'll be multiplying uh, our network, our people, our number of charging stations by about three every single year. So right now we're 150 people working fully dedicated to EV charging. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that the EVs, they, they really stand out in cutting emissions. 
uh, more than, than gas-powered um, vehicles. But of course, we often forget that a lot of the emission come from the production. So I, I want to hear your insight on that, uh, Ananta. Is, are, you, are you happy with everyone buying new cars? And, and so it, it's like jumping f you know, out of the frying pan and into the uh, fire. Um, EV car, I mean, electric vehicles are definitely the step forward. Uh, and then having car sharing and, you know, uh, other um, ideas like this, like, really does help the problem. But um, when you look at a lithium battery, uh, it's about 10%, less than 10% of lithium. The rest is nickel and cobalt. Where's the nickel and the cobalt coming from? Um, Elon Musk loves to say that we have unlimited lithium on the planet, but we have about 17 million metric tons. Uh, compare that to 80 million, which is um, lead, and then another 80, 89, which is nickel. So we do. there is a scarcity of resources. And then again, where is the metal coming from? It's coming from Indonesia, Chile, um, Australia, and, and some of these places have very sensitive economic zones. So, uh, ecological zones. So, with, with, when we have more electric cars, there's going to be a need for more uh, batteries. And, and that's going to come from these resources that we're trying to save. And we, we have all these discussions around saving, saving trees and forests. And, and, and that's where the minerals are coming from. So, it's really important that consumers understand um, where the material is coming from and whether it's from a politically or a geologically sensitive area and then the pollution that happens with, uh, with the production of it. I mean, it's not just production, but recycling. We think that recycling is the solution to having a product, but lead batteries, if recycled, you have air, water, land, severe pollution. Uh, if lead goes mm -hmm. into the... Um, you know, into the ecosystem, it causes nerve damage. But then it's the same for lithium. Lithium uh, is, and, and all other materials that were used previously in the entirety of battery industry have been, um, you know, they've been poisonous metals that even a little bit of contamination in the water is going to destroy the, the, region, the communities around it. So we are looking for a solution, but the solution is also leading to several other problems, which is again, coming to the topics of scarcity, pollution, and, and, and all of that. And I think as consumers, it's important to understand that if we want one extra thing, where is it coming from? How is it getting to you? Um, and, and then also, how is it possible for the average consumer to know? So traceability, accountability, they're going to be, in the next four years, we're going to see the rise of battery passports, digital passports that are going to bring transparency to where is each component and, and each material coming from. And that is going to give a lot more power to the business owners, to the manufacturers, but also to you guys as the consumers. Oh, um, like I said uh, in, in a previous discussion that we had, we have clothes that say, oh, 20% nylon, 80% cotton. Um, the battery should also be able to say, okay, it's got 8% lithium. We think it's a lithium battery, but it's actually a nickel, cobalt, and lithium battery. Um, and that this is, these are the regions where it's coming from, where one, there could be potential... Um, you know, the democracy of one area could be in jeopardy. So if you're interested, if the consumer is interested in knowing wh what is this whole thing, I mean, there's a, a fair phone also that's now coming up, uh, which is going to compete with the likes of like Samsung, where people have that want to be um, ecologically, like, you know, everything is ecologically sourced responsibly, then they will have the power to be able to do that. So. These are the developments that we're going to be seeing in the next four to five years, and it, a lot more power is going to come to the hands of the consumers where they will know what is in that one product that's in the market. If we increase the traceability, people will make a better informed choice. Better informed choices. And yeah. then maybe they're more aware of, oh, should I, should I really buy a new car? Because micro-mobility might be an option as well, and car sharing as well, of course. But Evan, um, how are we going to... How are we going to convince everyone to, or at least the people who, who might be able to choose car sharing? Because for a lot of people, a car stands for mobility and for freedom. So what's your, if you have a one-minute pitch, what would you say to convince them? 
Well, I guess the car industry have had 100 to 150 years to, to glamorize how it is to own a car, so it's not going to happen overnight, right? But my urge to the people here today and uh, always when I'm, I'm talking about this is to, to try it out. It works. Uh, we have a variety of all kinds of cars basically in every single street in Paris. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the experience, it's already there. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's about trying it out. Uh, our job now is to spread the word, to be more visible. Um, we don't have a huge marketing budget, so it needs to take like step by step. Um, but it's definitely working. Uh, and I mean, on a lot of businesses, I guess, listening in today, uh, sitting with corporate fleets, etc., there's also an opportunity to make some money on what is most likely quite an expensive uh, part of your P&L as well. Um, a lot of businesses are using their car Monday to Friday. Our peaks are on the weekends, so there's ways for sharing your fleet also with uh, our customers during the weekends. Uh, so it's not just you know on the demand side. We're working on both sides here. Uh, but all in all, um, the service is working. We've had hundreds of, of thousands of rentals, and I now think it's the time you know that this is still the early days, and we're about to see this starting to really take off. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned that you have to you have to collaborate with, with or a lot of a lot of companies they have a fleet and then during the weekend they don't use it so do you already have some collaboration with big companies where you uh, and they lend out their cars to um, your platform yeah, so I mean, we're a two-sided marketplace where the supply part, it's uh, mostly private people, but they're also, you know, businesses sharing their uh, part of their availability or even dedication to us. But um, I mean, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here is to optimize the usage of the capacity in the cars. Uh, and from a sustainability perspective, the more we can use the existing cars, the better. If everyone is buying an EV and replacing cars before they're like fully used, that's not going to help anything, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that uh, we can, you know, use the max capacity of the cars before they're out. And uh, the beauty also with our platform is that you can also, you know, list cars that are not, you know, only brand new. So there's also a secondary life here for cars for many, many years. Uh, and uh, to really make sure that all these, uh, everything that is put into the cars, we, we make the most of it, basically. All right. I see that our time is almost running. Uh, no, it's ran out already. So maybe one uh, last quick question to all of you. What's your biggest challenge? Which call to action do you want to ask to the audience? Ian, I'll start with you. Yeah, so my call to action for all of you is if you have a car that is nearing the end of the life, the next car you should get is definitely electric. Um, you should try it out. You will see the experience is easier than, than your current car because you can charge it everywhere. So that's a big advantage. You're also participating. You're doing your part for the climate. And ultimately, uh, you're paying way less uh, your energy than you would in your previous car. And uh, of course, come tries us out to on all the locations. We have, uh, like I said, over 6,000 charge points open uh, to the public. And, um, and we try to make it as convenient and as affordable for people to make the switch. All right. I give the floor to you. I would say um, use, reuse, and then recycle. Make sure that they use us all possibilities of repairing whatever you have, uh, and then you're reusing whatever you have, and then really try to judiciously use that one or any, any product that you have. Uh, but in terms of like batteries and energy, know where your batteries are coming from and know what's the actual cost that you're paying towards the battery that you're using. It's, it's heart-wrenching when you look at what's happening to these regions in, in Indonesia and in Africa. Uh, so be informed, be aware, and, and make the right choice. All right, and Evan. Yeah, the last famous words. I think uh, I'm going to urge all of you to be smart and be ambitious. And um, not just with Get Around, but there's a bunch of new... Just go out in the exhibition hall here today, and there's a bunch of new services. We need everyone to start using them, right? To foster innovation and to have some of these smaller startups here today to become, you know, big companies. We need, you know, people like us that comes here today to try, to try it out. Uh, so that's my big urge, and you know, all the companies you out here, what they need is customers. So uh, be ambitious, and uh, it's not scary to try something new. All right, I want to thank all of you. Please, you started already. Give them a warm round of applause. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Ananta and Ion, for this session.